All right. We'll talk a little bit about that. So welcome you guys to the, to the Pete workshop. I love in the, I love these chat uh, comments about why you guys are here. So mostly curiosity, experimentation, wanting to learn more. But this one that Laura said, curious about what healing possibilities are available that have been hidden from us because they aren't profitable. Like that's, I, I'm super fascinated by that too. So, so we'll bring that in. Oh my gosh, there's more comments that I can read. Uh, particularly looking like help with specific issues, skin, thyroid, um, different things about different time of day, urine, and all of that. So I think, um, buckle up, and away we go. We're talking about the pee workshop. So I'm going to bring up, I'm going to just bring up some slides here and just talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about me and, and for those who don't know me and kind of why I'm doing this and why I got into it, et cetera. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures as, as I talk. So basically 20 years at yogahealer.com, my background's as, a, as an Ayurvedic medicine practitioner. Ayurveda is the healing science from India. Ayu means life, Veda means to know or, or to study. And I've been devoted, I mean, even before I started Yoga Healer 20 years ago to personal and planetary thrive. I came from an international environmental background focused particularly on, on global warming and climate change and international um, in international solutions. And to me, this really ties into that. I've always looked at human consciousness and how, how do people, how do we thrive on this planet, right? Like this is pretty special stuff we got going on here on planet earth. So how do we thrive in our bodies and in our lives and, and all together? And one of the things to me about, you know, that this is the image from the moon of planet earth. It was the, one of the first images um, taken that we were able to see the planet is you see that you see the water, right? You see that, that life is sustained by, by water. You get, you get the blueness and, and the water. So we're going to talk about water and, and the water cycle today. So a bit on, you know, just on my background with Ayurveda and yoga and consciousness and enlightenment, um, it, it has also brought me into collaborative leadership. I've written a few books, one's on Body Thrive and the other's Master of You, which is much more Ayurveda applied to achieving your potential. And, and your life goals, which, which goes a lot into, into leadership and, and community. And what I find really fascinating is in my studies of Ayurveda over the last 20 years, I, uh, I hadn't really run that much into urine therapy. Like I did a little bit in terms of urine diagnosis, but not in terms of uh, trained practitioners in therapy. And this is kind of crazy because I have 500 podcast interviews, mostly with wellness leaders, mostly in yoga and in Ayurveda. And the topic really hasn't come up that much. And the more I've looked into it, it I think it's because of the taboo. And we'll get a little bit into, uh, not much, but I'll, I'll get a little bit into culture and taboo and how that shapes our belief system. Um, and why too, for, for many people that have discussed, you can start to see, is it cultural, the reasons you have discussed, or is it more um, biological? And that question to me gets, gets really interesting. I've been interested in free solutions. Like, what are the things that anyone can do without a socioeconomic barrier, right? Like that makes sense. To me, that makes the most sense of like, not necessarily expensive supplements and herbal formulas. And in my Ayurvedic medicine training, I was trained at probably in over a hundred plants as medicine and, and the combination of <laughs> the combination of plants uh, to create certain outcomes for certain health conditions. So it's not that um, those don't fit into the larger picture, but What's really driven me in my work are, are like, what are the most basic fundamentals of life on earth, here on earth, right? And it's that from Ayurveda and from any of the indigenous wisdom traditions, we get that there's, there's a connection to elements that seems to go beyond, um, beyond chemistry, that it goes more to, to the foundations of what is earth, what is water, what is fire, what is air, what is ether, and how can you use those conceptually to thrive, to balance to, I don't really like the word balance. To me, it's, it's really more about to harmonize and to actual, actuate your own potentiality. And that's really, what, that's really what's, you know, it drives me as a thought leader at Yoga Healer. We're a little hard to follow uh, because we're not just about thriving in your body. We're also about thriving in your life and thriving in your teens and, and peak performance. Uh, if there's anything I think I'm devoted to over time, it's that, that anyone for free can, tap into peak performance. And when you do that, life gets easier and it gets, and it gets more fun and it becomes way more fulfilling. 
And it doesn't get easier in the sense of like kicking back in the long chair easy. It gets easier in the sense of deep presence and ease and flow. It's like once you get balance and harmony, like there's a sense of you can be so present to tackle the bigger things that make greater things happen that, that reach deeper fulfillment. Um, and that's really to me where yoga healer goes into the future. Uh, and, and the whole topic of urine therapy and pee kind of came into the community and it really took our, we have a membership community here in terms of the, you know, what we really do is we guide our course members to success and every course member gets access to body thrive and the body thrive community. Once we started experimenting with, with urine therapy at the end of the Yogi detox in April, just took it by storm. And that's the power of being in a, in a, in a powerful community that's experimental and devoted to growth and devoted to improvement and peak performance is you're in a learner community. So things can happen fast. Change can happen really fast compared to like, say you're, the, you're, say you're learning about this on your own and there's no one you really have to talk to about it. It's going to be much harder. And that's true of any habit that you're trying to have, whether the habit has to do with calendaring your time or whether the habit has to do with exercise or, um, or how you're eating or how you're sleeping etc. If you're in a dynamic group of experimenters that's aiming towards peak performance, it's much easier and it's much, much faster. So before we get into the whole, and, and this is going to get fun, uh, we're going we're gonna to be talking about P. And I'm going to be showing you images from this next book that I'm writing. And I think it's called the P book. We're not quite sure if it's the P book or upcycle your P. And I just want to say now that uh, if you're interested in, in your body goals and peak performance and being part of a of a dynamic group community. Uh, one of the offers that I have for you guys today, and I'm just gonna uh, say that you can get an advanced copy of my P book. And it's not, and it's very much advanced copy. Like it's not ready to publish yet um, for, the, for the first 20 people who sign up for a body goals session. And you just do that at yogahealer.com forward slash body dash goals. And after your session, we'll give you the advanced copy of the P book. I'm gonna show you some images from the P book. They're not all in here, uh, but in any case, let's, uh, Let's dive in. Let's dive in. Let's dive into the deep end of, of the gold pool. So this idea, I, I, I'm making these slides because I think it's hilarious. What I'm finding the more that I do research on, on urine therapy is that there seems to be a lot of, uh, a lot of hidden wisdom and you got to dig around for it. And then you start, you start to find it anywhere. So I decided to make these billboard signs. Your pee, the instant fix for when you're in a jam or pee cycle for the planet or the idea that like to get into the gold room, like to get into to get into the place where this wisdom is held, like it seems like you need an invitation in. And that actually is historical in reference. So uh, urine therapy goes back. It goes back to the Dhammar Tantra um, in the Vedic in the, in the Vedic lineage. So the studies of Ayurveda and yoga. So this is old. This is a very old text, 5,000 years old. A lot of the Ayurvedic and yogic texts that a lot of us who've studied Ayurveda and yoga seriously are about 2,000 years old to 1,000 years old. So 5,000 years old to me means like a long time ago, <laughs> right? And often stories start with like once upon a time. So once upon a time, a long time ago, there's 107 sutras and the Dhammar Tantra. And, and the sutras go something like this, Parvati and Shiva, they're a couple. And Parvati knows that Shiva has a secret. And she's wondering, like, basically like, dude, why do you, why are you always like on point? Like, why do you look so good? Like, how come it's always working out for you? And so that's really where that the Dhammar Tantra begins. And what's interesting is the 107th shloka of the, or sutra of the Tantra is him telling her to keep it a secret. And I think that's just super fascinating. Like for some reason, it's been, it's been secretive for at least 5,000 years. So if you haven't found out much about it, it's because it's a secret. And so a lot of what I'm doing is trying to, uh, I mean, I'm basically putting a lot of my reputation at stake by doing this, but I'm, I'm taking the, the loudspeaker and saying, you know what, I think it's time for this to, to, to leave the secret societies and to come, to come out of the closet. So his big secret in the Dhammar Tantra is that he drinks his morning pee and she's in disbelief. And then he talks a little bit about, about why it works. So it turns out it's the, the golden fountain of youth. 
and that it destroys disease. And this is straight out of this Tantra. And, we, and it's fascinating. A lot of people say, well, oh, this is um, folk medicine or witchcraft or, uh, you know, in, in many ways, not, not giving it its attribute. And later in this talk today, we're actually going to look at some of the science of how pee is being turned into pharmaceuticals so that we can see that, you know, we are taking pee as medicine. We are taking pee as medicine. We just might not be using our own. Um, and to Laura's point in the beginning, like there's not much profit. There's not much profit in you consuming or utilizing or upcycling your own pee. So here she is and she's saying pee is toxic waste and he's saying it's the cultural misconception. And now I'm just having fun with art. So this isn't really in the Damar Tantra at this part. This is more common culture right now where we have a misconception around what pee actually is. And in the next 20 minutes, we're gonna get deep into like, what is pee? Like, how much do we actually know about it? Uh, and, and how can it help us to know, to know more about it? Um, especially in terms of, of this idea that it's connected to a radiant longevity, which is different than just longevity because people are living a long time now, but people are living a long time now and they're not in radiance, right? They're not radiant. They're not shining light through them. They're often a, you know, just living in, in often an enormous degree of inflammation, chronic systemic inflammation, which has a number of, um, uh, Oh, symptoms that are all unpleasant. They're all just, you know, not good. So this is different. This is, this is a conversation about what's actually in P and how does it, how does it seem to do a number of things? Some are on the very physical level in terms of, of disease and physical level. Others are on the disease level of mental and emotional. And then we'll even get into psycho-spiritual. So plasma, plasma ultrafiltrate, plasma, isn't that part of my blood? Yeah, your kidneys filter blood from your liver to regulate the blood nutrient balance. And so she says, if I drink my pee, why would I drink my pee if my kidneys, if they don't want it? And he says, you can create a feedback loop from your body to know what's going on and to upcycle it. So you can actually reuse some of what's in it. And so nature works in cycles. And this is what I wanna, uh, I, I wanna get into a little bit about nature working in cycles here. So we all know the water cycle. I think you, this is maybe somewhere between seventh and ninth grade science in most, of the, in most of the world, where you learn about this process of, of water being cyclical from, from evaporating from the oceans to condensing to precipitating and raining down, to having runoff, to percolation, um, and, and back into bodies of water for evaporation. We're all also familiar with the compost cycle, right? Where we eat food, creates food scraps, those compost, the compost itself is naturally a fertilizer. And then that fertilizer we add to soil to grow crops and plants that then become our food. So this whole idea that nature works in cycles, that a, a part of it is connected to the whole of it. And that's true. Um, the more subtle you get in your awareness, the more the subtle level of what's going on in the cycle becomes important to you, which is why many of you are into organic farmers markets and, and farm to table restaurants or growing food in your own garden or composting at home is because you're, you're wanting to tap more into different parts of the cycle because you realize that your inner ecology is a reflection of the cycle, including the level of consciousness of humans interacting with each of these stages, right? And, and, I, and I know a lot of you make your own food because you notice when you make your own food, you feel better. That's part of, that's part of the cyclical nature of consciousness. So again, the, the cycle and consciousness are really um, tapped in. And I think that's why, as we see in, in different texts, uh, there's, you know, these parts that with urine therapy that start out really physical and where it starts to go is actually quite metaphysical. Uh, and that's why I think for us at Yoga Healer, we're like the first, we're like the perfect brand to make urine therapy more popular <laughs> because we're working at the level of, of body and life, but we're also working at the level of, of consciousness and enlightenment. Okay, so she says, my pee is actually blood plasma packed with healthy microbiome that feeds my cells. And, and this is to me where it gets really fascinating, right? Is we have, and we're gonna get into blood in a moment, 
but where we start to see what's in the urine is in the plasma of the blood and that there's a way for the body to actually upcycle and get this feedback loop of information, including the feedback loop uh, in terms of level of consciousness. And that that's increasingly fascinating. Yeah. Oops. Okay, now we're good. So let's look at Buddhism. So this comes from uh, this comes from this comes from the the Pali uh, the Pali Canon, which is the oldest Buddhist text. Meaning, like we think that these texts are straight out from from the Buddha, from Gautama Buddha, which to me is fascinating because now we're saying like, okay, there's some stuff going on. Um, with the yogis or something going on with Buddhism. What I found in urine therapies, from what I can tell, it shows up in every indigenous culture. So anywhere humans are wild or more wild, it shows up. And there's a big rewilding humanity movement right now. And maybe it's not, it's not nearly as big enough, big as it should be. <laughs> uh, but, but this whole idea of, of you are better off the more wild you are, you're more you. You're more you outside of culture, outside of the cultural socioeconomic engine. You're more you. And when you're more you, you're thriving. And so this whole concept of, of, of where do these teachings come from with urine therapy, they seem to come from everywhere. Like once you really start to look, and they're all over veterinary science. So it's not even just like humans as mammals, but it's all over uh, it's all over veterinary science as well. And that's to me, when you see truths popping up from everywhere uh, in different places across different times, you know, you're sort of onto something, right? That it's not, it's not fringe, um, it's actually fundamental. And to me, that, that's fascinating. Okay, so what is, what is the Buddha saying? And he's saying going forth, fermented urine, uh, going forth has fermented urine medicine as its support for the rest of your life. You are to endeavor to that. So, and then he says, there's, there's four, four trifles that you need. So mendicants is like, Hey, anyone who, anyone here who's really hell bent on enlightenment or haven't bent on enlightenment, there's like four things you're going to need, right? What are you going to need? Well, you can use rags for ropes. Like you can use like basically what other people have discarded for your, for your clothing you need a lump of alms food. So you don't need much food. If you think of like a lump of food, did you have more than a lump of food yesterday? These like, that's basically what, what you need. Lodging's at the root of a tree. So nature will take care of you. And fermented urine is medicine. So if we break this up, this is what I'm saying. Uh, this whole idea is that you are supported and there's something in the fermentation or the decomposing process that seems to be the lever in how medicinal urine becomes. So, and not everybody needs medicine either, right? So some people just need hydration, but he's saying at the level of medicine, you ferment your urine. All right. So this whole idea too, if we look at this process of, of what's coming out of the body and the cyclical nature of upcycling, what I want to look at next is like really what is upcycling in the pee. So there's, we all know that when, when compost breaks down, it's, it's uh, breaking down into microbes. And I think we all know about the microbiome at this point that like, it, it's actually super fascinating when you look back at belief systems and, and, and scientific theory and how that goes into medical theory and how that goes into pharmacological theory uh, you see in the 1960s, a discovery that bacteria is good. Before 1960, you don't have that. You only have bacteria is bad. And now what we know about humans that are more rewilded um, and mammals that are wild is they have about 30% more bacteria in their body than, than we do, <laughs> even if we're pretty healthy, right? So who we are, who we are is more of a, of a microbiome colony and it is a, uh, you thinking that you're just you. And so the more you, so the more you're interactive in a healthy way with microbiome, uh, the healthier you are, the more energy you have. And interestingly enough, like the, the easier it is to live in the, in the sort of like the craziness of the modern world. So the microbiome has three main, three main parts, the gut part, the lung part, and the skin part. And that's going to get, I think, more and more important the more you get into urine therapy, because you're looking at those three main applications of like mouth through anus, digestive tract is gut microbiome, nostrils in through sinuses into lungs, 
as your breathing microbiome and your skin as your inside outside navigator microbiome. And we know that right now, like people's microbiomes are super challenged and it's challenging to the point where their immune systems are starting to fight their bodies, right? That's called autoimmune disease. And where does autoimmune disease, uh, where, does, where are the first signs and symptoms of autoimmune disease? It's in a breakdown of the immune system. And the first sign of the breakdown of the immune system is allergies. And if you look at allergies, you're like, oh, right. People have allergies. They chose up on their skin as itchy skin, itchy eyes. People have allergies uh, to food and that shows up in their digestive tract, being resistant to eating and absorbing certain foods. And people have allergies in terms of creating mucus, right? From lungs and through sinuses and out through nose and mouth. So we have a good idea if we have allergies or if we have any sort of problem adapting to our environment, that there's an issue with our immune system, that we're already immunocompromised. We might not go to the whole full blown effect of having a, of a disease um, that's at the level of our endocrine system, but we know that, wow, we're not living in sync. We're not living in harmony. We're not like inside, outside are, are really doing, doing well together. So epigenetics, and many of you have heard of epigenetics, and, and it's, it's, it's basically saying that epi is above. So it's of a, it's of a higher order. It's of a higher operating system. And what we know about health and disease is that environment trumps. Environment trumps the gene. So if anyone ever plays bridge, you know, like the trump card, like if you pull out a trump card, like you're going to win. You're going to win that hand unless someone can trump your trump, right? So the idea of being above of something trumping something else, it's saying that something that can be of a higher order. So no matter what your genes are in relation to disease, you can create an environment that enables your, your genes to not mutate, that enables you to stay in a really healthy environment. Uh, cellularly speaking, and, the, and that's completely connected to healthy microbiome and bacteria. Are you guys with me? Kind of get it? I know we're like in a bunch of different places at the same time. Uh, things to keep in mind, because what you're looking at is what is the environment of your blood? And the urine's gonna tell you a, a, lot about, a lot about that. Okay, so this is what I said we'd talk about, what every four-year-old should know. Five ways you can use your pee right away. How to reverse your health issues with pee upcycling. How to overcome the ick or yuck or disgust factor. And a little bit about the history um, in world traditions, including Ayurveda. So hopefully you know a little bit more now than you did before about what pee is more, you know, in terms of like what, what a four-year-old might know about it. Let's get a little bit more into how, how this whole idea of how pee upcycling can cure disease. And again, this is a re reference to the ancient text, right? And there's a lot that, uh, there's a lot of like anti-cancer factors in urine that we can look at. There's a lot of factors that promote good bacteria and kill bad bacteria that we'll look at. And uh, again, in the, in the podcast series that I'll drop in the fall, we'll get a lot more into the, to the science and um, the, yeah, to the science behind it and part of the medicine behind it. So there's something that I'm seeing that because pee is packed with a microbiome, it supports healthy tissue. There's also components in the urine, like ammonia and urea, that seem to have the effect of destroying bacteria and viruses. So let's take a moment and look a bit at what, at what is actually in pee. So it's 95% water, it's 2% urea. So those are like the two, the two really big factors in it. And then there's the ammonia and then there's a bunch of other um, compounds within it. If we look at the whole idea that it's, uh, that it's already assimilated water, that's already been in the, it's already been in the blood. It gets a little bit fascinating for those who you can study Ayurveda. You're looking at plasma. You're looking at, uh, if you look at this slide of the, of the blood vessel and what's in it, you see like the big red things first, maybe the, the red blood cells. Um, you see the white blood cells, those, those much bigger cells, the purple ones. But then in that yellowy liquid, that's the plasma. So that's the plasma. So urine is ultra plasma filtrate. And if we look at the composition of plasma, we're going to see what's in plasma is in urine. 
So when you upcycle your urine, you're making it easier for your body to make higher quality plasma. You know, anyone who studied Ayurveda, and I know that's only maybe about 10% of the people here, you know, Ahara Rasa is the precursor to making really strong blood plasma, which is Rasa Datu. Now the blood plasma, the yellow stuff in here, this is what in Ayurvedic theory nourishes all levels of tissue of the body simultaneously. So you have the deepest concept of nourishment at the most superficial level with blood plasma. Now, if there's anything wrong with blood plasma, like if there's anything not going swimmingly, maybe it's too acidic, maybe your microbiome's weak, maybe uh, it's not uh, probiotic enough or supporting life function enough. Maybe it's been dumbed down by dumb food or stress. Uh, which is just decrease the life force energy within it and the ability for the body to sort out what's toxic coming in through the mind and the body from what is nutritive, then you're going to have issues that show up at the level of plasma. Anything that shows up at the level of plasma that's done continuously, diet and lifestyle continuously, too much on the mind, too much in the body, or not the right nutrients, you're going to see that go through all levels of tissue because this is whenever imbalances show up in plasma, because it's nourishing all the other tissue of the body, the imbalances just move from plasma into deeper levels of tissue, which is why Ayurvedic practitioners are obsessed with digestion and they're obsessed with plasma, right? They know that like plasma has got to be clean. If plasma is clean and strong and healthy and nutritive, you're going to get good red blood cells. You're going to get good muscle tissue. You're going to get good fat tissue. You're going to get good bone marrow tissue. You're going to get good reproductive tissue and you're going to get the crowning jewel of all the jewels, uh, did I talk about? Yeah, you're going to get OGIS. You're going to get like the deep, resilient immune system that's adaptable and resilient at the same time. And when you have that, you know you have good plasma. If you don't have that, you kind of can trace it back and be like, oh, maybe my plasma doesn't have exactly what it needs to be able to build a really strong, robust experience of of the immune system, which is like, I feel great no matter where I am. I've got deep energy reserves. Uh, I can handle a lot. I can handle a lot of that, which doesn't go swimmingly. That's all a good sign that you've got um, deep hydration and deep intelligence at the level of, of blood plasma. Okay. So that's just like, if you were to spin, this actually to me gets really fascinating. If you were to spin your blood through a centrifuge, you'd end up with plasma, white blood cells and platelets and red blood cells. I just had a ton of little personal side note here. Um, regener I, I was trying to solve a problem with my, my knees. I'm very athletic and I had what I, a lot of loose ligaments in my left knee. It seemed like they were torn from a number of athletic injuries involving mountain bikes and paddle boards and whatnot and skis. Uh, we thought it was a ligament issue. So in the regenerative medicine world, which is sort of like the peak performance world of, of um, Western medicine or allopathy, they do a lot of injections of things. So when they take the, well, with regenerative medicine, um, one, of the, one of the varieties of that is called PRP. And it's where they take, your they, they take your blood, they spin it through a centrifuge and it breaks up into these three sections. Then they take that little part in the middle, the platelets, and the blood cells and they extract that out and then they inject it around the joint site so that your, your body gets the stem cells and the growth hormone and the platelets that are already in your own blood. Now this gets really fascinating as we look at like, why does urine historically and even more powerfully when fermented seem to cure disease, including joint pain and joint injuries? And to me, that's where it gets really fascinating because we know this in modern medicine in a way, but we're making it harder than it maybe needs to be to get stem cells and, and platelets and growth hormone. So let's look at what is, what is actually in our pee. Let me grab, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the slide here. What is actually upcycling when we use it? And I think the question right now is like, how would you use your pee? So you, you, I obviously have these pictures of like people chugging like a, a liter or a quart jar of, of pee. And that's like a very advanced way to go, right? So we'll talk about like the beginner first steps as well. But if we look at what's in it, it seems to be, uh, it, it seems to be packed with, with protein. I have, a good, I have a good slide on this. It's this one. 
Um, so if we look at what's in blood plasma, you can see that blood plasma, not talking about urine here, I'm talking about blood plasma, has seven to nine percent proteins, right? And that's outside of the salt and that's outside of the urea that's already, that's already in plasma. If we look at what's in urine besides water, so we've got urea, you'll see 6% amino acids. So the amino acids and polypeptides, that's what builds protein. Those are the protein building blocks. So you have the stuff that's building good protein in the body. And I think anyone who's been interested in like keto or paleo or more of like the high protein diet, like you might want to perk your ears on this because it's probably a much less expensive way for you to get your protein needs met um, to a much greater degree to be in a ketogenic state. Uh, urine actually has ketones in it as well. So I think this is why like a lot of people who are into intermittent fasting or fast mimicking diet find that when they do that with, with upcycling their own urine through their skin, through enemas or, or through drinking it, that it's like, it's a lot easier to be in that ketogenic deep fasting state And the ketogenic state has apoptosis in it, which means your cells will kill dysfunctional cells. So if cells, have, say you, say you have like a precancerous condition or a cancerous condition and your cells are already mutating right? The body will find, the more you're in a ketogenic state, fasting state, the more your body will find the cells that have already gone haywire and gobble them up, essentially digest them into waste product. Okay. So we've got all this stuff in our urine. And, and if we look at, uh, again, there's a lot of protein, but then there's a lot of other there's a lot of these little other ingredients in it. Uh, you can see there's the, the peptides over there at 0.05%. You also have the immunoglobulins. Now this gets really fascinating with the connection to the immune system and why, why does urine upcycling seem to be able to kill the bacteria and viruses that your body doesn't want and nourish the microbiome or the good bacteria that your body wants? Like that's a really fascinating question because modern medicine can't do that. Like anyone who's ever had chemotherapy will tell you like kills the good stuff along with the bad stuff. Right. And that's what makes it so hard. That's why the hair falls out. The nails turn kind of nasty. Digestion falls apart. Right. The skin turns ashen because it's destroying the good microbiome along with the bad microbiome. So why does, why does, why does urine seem to be able to do the self-selecting process? And it has to do with what's, what's, what what is in it. Uh, you've got cholesterol, which is a building block for cells. You've got triglycerides. So again, with triglycerides, many of you are thinking like, oh wait, triglycerides, they test for that in my blood, right? So we have all these things that appear in blood that are appearing in urine. We also have, you can see the, uh, you can see some of the hormones starting to, to show up at this level as well. And I'm gonna go back to my little homemade slide from my P book. The hormones that we see upcycling in urine, dopamine, melatonin, serotonin, and oxytocin, um, a lot of us want more of these. And it doesn't matter if you're, uh, if you're a teenager going through puberty, uh, a, a midlife woman trying to become pregnant, or a midlife male who's maybe uh, wanting to have offspring, uh, going through the time of life phases in, in midlife where your hormone cycles start to dramatically change, um, which can either lead to rapid aging or refinement. So for men looking at testosterone and DHEA, for women looking at how do you move through menopause in a way that's like, you know, super sweet and easy and you just get better and better. Hormones are something that at different stages in life, we want to pay a lot of attention to. They're also very expensive for the body to make. And we'll look at that in terms of the, the cell complex and, and the structure. For me, what really caught my eye was like stem cells and growth hormone, because I was paying thousands of dollars to get stuff like that injected into joint sites, right? And anyone who's, who's done that and you're wondering like, wait, I could just drink my pee? Stem cells and growth hormone are in it? Or I could do enemas or rub it into my skin? That's pretty, that's pretty fascinating. On the detox and healing side, this, this is what, I mean, one of the most, I think, fascinating things to me is like the more you do urine therapy, uh, the more you, you're using it orally or drinking it, first of all, it changes. So when you first start using urine therapy, you have an aversion to it. Uh, and that's cultural. More than, more than biological, it, it is cultural. Uh, but it's also because your urine is pretty, it, it can be pretty toxic. 
And the reason it can be pretty toxic is because you haven't used your urine to kill off the, the bad bi viruses and bacteria and that which is non-self or what in Ayurveda we call ama or that which is not digested. So say you have a lot of inflammation in your body. It's like your, your, uh, your body's ability to create really clean, pure water out of your urine is very, very much compromised. But the more you do urine therapy, the more the taste of your urine changes. What it starts to taste like more and more, uh, sorry, let me get rid of that. What it starts to taste like more and more and this is what's so weird, is it tastes like an electrolyte drink. It tastes like the most hydrating electrolyte drink you've ever had. Now that gets super curious, doesn't it? Because on like one level, you might be thinking like, I have my own electrolyte drink. Like I don't need to A, buy a fancy sports drink, but like B, I have, it's always with me. I can't really get dehydrated. There's a story of this guy, uh, this Chinese guy who was stuck on a raft for four months and he, he just upcycled his pee. He didn't really have access really much to um, food. Like he maybe caught a fish here or there, but like he was basically, you know, drifting in the ocean. They found him four months later and they expected him just to be like, you know, a total wreck. And he wasn't. He was like, actually, no, I'm feeling all right. Like I feel pretty strong here. Well, why? He's upcycling, his body's upcycling its own protein. So it's actually feeding his tissue. He wasn't emaciated. Isn't that nuts? Like the idea that you have what you are within you, it's many of you have had these teachings at a yogic level or a spiritual level, but you haven't had that experience on a physical level. And when you have that experience on that level, you start to get a sense of like, wow, I really have, I really have what I'm a self-contained system to a much greater degree than I ever thought. And the more self-contained you get, the more actually interdependent you get with, with nourishment because you then are upcycling nourishment. So you start to pay more attention to what you're upcycling. So you can also see that it's probiotic, that it has antibodies in it. Um, it has enzymes in it. And I'm going to get a little bit into in a bit, like how you already know all that. Uh, it, it, actually, I'll show you right now because it's pretty funny. Let me just grab the slide. It's way down here. This is funny. Um, Anyone who, any, anyone who's ever been with someone taking a pregnancy test or taking a pregnancy test, yeah, the way that it works is you pee on a stick and all of a sudden you get a red line or you get a, or you don't. And that's how you know if you're pregnant or not, or that you get two red lines and one's a plus and one's a minus, et cetera, right? How does it work? Well, there's enzymes in antibodies, right? That are showing up in the urine that are testing for us. So we already know we already know that this stuff's in our, in our pee. I think one of the questions that I was most fascinated by when I first started to look at, at urine therapy was, well, is it, is it sterile or not? Because how can something be both probiotic and sterile? You follow me? If it's probiotic, it means there's life in there. And what I've, what I've landed on from a bunch of research is it's not sterile, it's antiseptic. It's antiseptic. And that's really different. So antiseptic helps you heal wounds, which is why in, in World War II, or sorry, World War I, um, and I'm sure for many, many years before, but it was actually documented uh, by this guy, uh, Armstrong, who wrote one of the first urine therapy books. He was a urine therapist starting in World War I and, and through World War II. Uh, and, and basically you pee on a wool sock, you wrap it around your rotting wound and it heals itself. Right. And we've used, we've, uh, people that have done animal husbandry have used that also for, you know, time immemorial in order to heal animal wounds. So we know that pee is antibiotic, antibacterial, antiseptic, and antiviral, um, but it's not sterile. It's probiotic. And anyone who's orally taking probiotics or, or, you know, using more probiotic type foods and supplements, the probiotic industry has gone absolutely magnificently haywire, as has the electrolyte industry, right? And you start to think like, wait, this stuff's, I'm just peeing it out. That's fascinating. The detoxifying effect of urine therapy um, is what it can really, I think, throw throw people off is you might start using it depending on how much inflammation you have in your body, your body's going to start throwing off, off symptoms. It's going to start to detox. And, and that can be scary. Anyone, I mean, we've been teaching yogi detox here since 2002, twice a year, every year without stop. And I can tell you when people hit detox symptoms, they want to stop. Right. And, and what you usually should do at that point is just slow down 
to slow down or pause, but not stop, right? Because it means it's working. It means it's moving the stuff that's in your body that your body doesn't want out of your body. When that happens, you start to have a much cleaner, a much cleaner operating system. Okay, so actually, let me back up in my slides here. We'll go through a few more slides. Okay, so here she is. She's like, who else does this? And, uh, oh, there's lots of pee drinkers. And then they meet the closet pee drinker. This is in the urine book. Um, and so she, they, they, she starts to talk, actually, let me go into the urine. <laughs> this whole idea of like, how, how are people upcycling their pee? They're all underground because they're supposed to keep it a secret because everyone else thinks it's totally disgusting. <laughs> So they don't want to be made fun of. In our Body Thrive membership community, what we've noticed both on the forum and on the live calls, uh, and we have coaching calls every week in Body Thrive, we, we have noticed that there's a desire to keep it secret. Like when you start doing it, there's a natural desire to keep it secret. And I think that's super fascinating. Like I didn't have that at all, but um, I've already been through, I think, a lot of levels of of being weird and being vocal about being a little bit counterculture. I think I've got 20 years experience in that. So for me, I didn't really run into that, um, but it's something that most people we're finding do run into. And that's why it's really helpful to be part of a membership community where things are, where change is normal and countercultural behaviors that are healthier than culture are also normal because you get traction way faster way, way faster and because there, there's less resistance. You can have honest conversations about what, what is going on. So how are people upcycling their pee? Basically, you have a lot of holes in your body. And now it's about 15 years ago, I created a worksheet for the Living Ayurveda course members and it was called Oil and Orifices. And showing like you can put oil in all these different holes of your body, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your ears, your, vi your, your vagina, if you're female, um, your anus, uh, for, for all body types, like you can, your skin, which is full of tiny micro pores everywhere. And the same thing is true, of course, for urine. And my guess is a lot of the oil therapies in Ayurveda came out after urine therapy went underground. And the reason it went underground, as far as I can tell, has something to do with uh, the, the rise of the Brahman caste system and its emphasis on purity and sanctity and its protection of wisdom. Right. And in caste systems, you have different differentiated knowledge, right? And the highest caste holds the most knowledge. So there's a reason to protect that. The same thing around the same time, interestingly enough, seemed to arise with uh, in Christianity or in the Judeo Christian system, right? Where this idea of protected knowledge is important and this idea of purity. And you see that more rise like way th a thousand plus years later with the rise of Puritanism. But the idea that to be pure means to not to not have right relationship with, with waste. And we can see that, actually there's a slide way down here. Um, this kind of seems to pop up that like, things are taboo versus things are good. So we can see this in the Judeo-Christian system, like historically, like sex is bad, urine is bad, I am bad, <laughs> I'm a sinner, right? I'm separate or apart from the whole, heaven is good, earth is bad. Like those things seem to be in, the cultural response on the other side is like you could say is a culture of body sacred where sex is good urine is good even poop is good cravings are smart i am good i am a holism of the whole life is good the body is intelligent consciousness is important and someone can evolve so it's important for you to realize whatever groups you're part of and that's a family group it's a community group there's beliefs, there's a culture happening. And if that culture isn't helping you get to your goals, you have a problem because it means it's going to work against you. Beliefs are usually not explicit. We try at Yoga Healer and all our course to make our beliefs and convictions very explicit, very much on the outside, right? So you can, either, so you can self identify with like, oh, that's what I've been looking for rather than keep them hidden a few levels beneath teachings. It's more on the outside so that you can self-identify. If you're finding that you're in this place of like, wow, I'm interested in this stuff, but I need to keep it secret, uh, then it tells you that the cultures that you're in don't support your beliefs. Long dramatic pause for emphasis. Should be very quick, right? Yeah, it's hard to think that God actually invented clothes. When do you, when do you yeah, think he just invented nature? He invented... 
Yeah, let me make, um, Kim, let me make you a co-host. And so you can mute people. Hold on, you guys. We are now experiencing technical difficulties. H I J K. Oh, or Casey, I'll just do it for you. Casey, you can be co-host. Okay, good. All right. All right, so we have the idea here that plasma, like what does plasma look like? And what you might see is plasma actually looks quite a bit, I find this kind of fascinating. It looks quite a bit like as urine ferments. So as urine ferments, it changes. And I need to interview more scientists on this who've really looked at it and studied it, but it seems what happens according to the urine therapy community um, is that you actually get increase of stem cells and growth hormone. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne, for the raised eyebrows. Like anyone who's really been studying regenerative medicine might be like, whoa, this stuff's free? It's in me? I don't need to like get some stem cells out of an umbilical cord. Like it's, it's in me and all I have to do is collect it and let it off gas and change over time and ferment. And for how long? Well, it seems, I don't know as, as much about this as other people do, but it seems like four plus months. And then it just gets better and better and better. So the smell changes, the taste changes, et cetera. I'm currently, because I'm only about two and a half months in, close to three months in, um, I just noticed that like the older it is, the, the more dramatic the effect it is. All right. So this is what like, a, <laughs> this is what your medicine cabinet might start to look like right, where you have dates and labels of, of how long you've been aging your pee and the how to do it, you cover it with a, like basically like cheesecloth and a rubber band, label it, put a date. Sunshine seems to do it good. You let it off gas. I wanna go back to uh, how, how people are using it and what like a morning routine, a morning routine might look like. So again, many of you who've studied Ayurveda or yoga, you know from yoga about sense organ care, how it, the more clear your sense organs are, the more you're accurately perceiving the world, you're more in touch with reality. So the sense organ care was always very, very high up for yogis. It was like very high on the list, right? Because how you perceive reality means that's what you're experiencing. If you want to experience more and more subtle levels or higher orders of reality, you start to pay a lot more attention to keeping your sense organs fit and you start to notice aversion because your sense organs will steer you away from that which is lower vibration in terms of sounds in terms of sights in terms of textures on your skin or breathability of, of cloth on your skin in terms of uh, what you're actually putting in, in your in your mouth and then again you're sensing through taste and you start to get really exquisite with taste and the six tastes and you start to be able to design your physiology more from your senses. So when you start the day right, like your your pee in the mouth, pee in your eyes, pee on your skin, pee up your nose, pee in your ears. So you're you're tuning your senses, you're clearing and cleansing your senses, and then you're ready to go get them, get on with your day. Uh, and again, like there's maybe a bit of a shock experience, I think for any of you who are like just kind of curious and you're coming in here and being like, whoa, this is a lot more than I would have expected that people are doing with, with their pee or I could do with my own pee. And I just want to say that's totally normal because what we've been, you know, we've, what we've been indoctrinated into is, is something that's uh, a, a little bit more like you know, a, a little bit more like P is like this, like P is disgusting, right? Like that this is something that's just that not, not in the realm of, of what to do. Okay, I wanna show you a little bit about, uh, now that we get that like what's in our plasma, right? Is, the, is all of what's in our P, our P seems to be the building blocks of our plasma. Plasma of a high quality is of high priority in order to get plasma that has more probiotics, more enzymes, more polypeptides, more hormones in it, it means the body can make better plasma. And that means that the plasma can do a better job feeding all levels of tissue of the body. So you get deeper nourishment, but you also get a tendency for cells or, um, or for genes not to mutate in the, in the cell replication process. Does that make sense? You just get smarter. Yeah. You get the smarter building blocks of nourishment in, in your body. 
What's fascinating, um, as P went underground, this is kind of funny, um, as P went underground, the, the use of using animal urine didn't. This is actually kind of fascinating. If we look at, um, and this is in Indian medicine in Ayurveda, uh, the use of cow urine didn't go underground as much as the use of hum human urine. And so we can see like even supplements on the market of like, well, what's in, it's okay to have cow urine. Now, why are we using cow urine in a supplement? Well, this is, this is fascinating. VHCA cow urine capsules destroys the poisonous effects of residues and makes the body disease free. Like that's on the label of this, of this cow urine supplement that's sold uh, mostly in India, though I'm sure you can import stuff like this into the United States. So this is fascinating, all kinds of disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, and effective in mental illness. Like what's going on there? Why is it affecting mental illness? Well, if we go back, if we go back to what's in our pee, remember the part that you've got all these hormones, you've got oxytocin, you've got serotonin, you've got the feel good hormones and they're now upcycling. So your body's getting more of the feel good hormones. So if you have too much on your mind, too much on your mind creates chronic systemic inflammation. It can emerge as anxiety, depression, or, or irritability, right? And that's all inflammatory. So there's something in urine that's anti-inflammatory. It doesn't matter if it comes from a cow or from a camel or from your own body. It takes the inflammation out. It nourishes the deeper level of tissue and it upcycles your hormones, especially when you take it in through your skin or in through your um, in through your, your, your bunghole, so to speak. Okay. So here she is. First time pee massage. This was me. This is me. I cannot believe I'm doing this. My kid couldn't either. We were in a, uh, we were, I think, where were we at? We were at a gymnastics tournament, whatever they call them, a gymnastics meet. And I had brought my pee bottle to the hotel room or I brought my little jar. I filled my jar up and I sat down on a hotel towel and started to, and she was like, I can't believe you're doing that. I'm like, I can't believe I'm doing this either. So if that's you just know, like that's, it's totally, it's totally normal to do that. Uh, this is, this is our heroine saying, I can't, I can't bring myself to drink it. And really the key with this seems to be, you know, just starting small, just starting with a few drops, just starting with a few drops under your tongue. Uh, over time, what happens is you get really, you, you get into a place where it doesn't, there's no aversion and then there's preference. I did a little video on Facebook yesterday of like, I've, after two and a half months, I'm going towards preference. It took me a couple months to get there where it's like a preferred beverage over water a lot of the time. That's whoa, right? Holy cow. And you guys, I don't really have a horse in this race. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't looking to become like the queen of pee therapy at Yoga Healer. So it just sort of happened. And I think this is kind of how it happens for people that are more into peak performance. I don't think the average, like for the average user, <clears throat> the average user of pee therapy, it kind of goes back to, to what, what Shiva's saying in here of, where is it? He's like, I drink my morning pee. That's it. And in the ancient text, it's first catch midstream. From other urine therapists, I've learned that like that really doesn't matter so much. Um, it's just your morning pee because it's packed with all of what your body processed overnight. So instead of peeing every couple of hours, which maybe it has more water in it, this is like the, the, it's the strongest, it's like the strongest medicinal of the day. The prime minister of India in the nineties, who lived to about 95 years old. Um, he was a big fan of just that, of like, just sorry, with morning pee. Um, and that's it. Like a cup of liquid a day. What I found is that like getting into it, it's, harder to drink your morning pee. That's like the most serious. It's the most, and again, if you have AMA, it's going to be, you're going to have the, the most repulsion from that. Then if you start more with like your mid afternoon pee, you can also start with just a few drops on your skin and just kind of starting getting used to, to using your pee. And thanks for, to Megan McDonald for introducing the body thrive community to just starting with a couple drops on your skin, then a couple drops under your tongue. And you're just assimilating, you're getting the body used to the body. And that process itself, that process itself is the process of, of rewilding. Okay, this is kind of fun. Uh, 
So we, we were there. Let's go into what's, this is really kind of fascinating. This is on cow urine. Cow urine is found to be effective against drug resistant bacteria strains. So you know how a lot of people are worried about like the, you know, because you've maybe taken antibiotics a number of times, you're less, um, your body is less resilient against new viruses or new bacteria. Cause again, it's antiviral and antibacterial. So this is just looking at bacterial strains. They're finding with cow urine is like, it's, it's still effective. And that, so that means like, no matter like how damaged you might be from, from pharmaceuticals, right. And, and no matter how damaged your immune system might be or resistant uh, to new bacteria or new viruses, that it seems to be that there's a really cool way that you get, uh, what is it? Post photo activation and purification is, is capable of countering antibiotic resistance. This is a, a really famous guy in, in Bollywood. He's one of the fittest actors of Bollywood. So this again is India. Um, reveals he drinks his cow urine daily, right? And going into, into how, uh, how, how Ayurvedic theory supports that. This, is, this totally cracked me up when I found this one. I was looking more, uh, there was a lot, like, I, I studied Chinese political theory before I went into, into, uh, into Ayurveda. And, and this is kind of hilarious, basically in Hong Kong and Hong Kong's like the, you know, like they're the rebellious ones in the Chinese front. And they, uh, there was like this huge um, surge of popularity of urine therapy happening in Hong Kong. And the Chinese government who were like very into control did not want that to spread into China. So they outright banned drinking your own urine. Can you imagine trying to regulate that? Like how hard would that be? Who's going to go to the bathroom with you and see what you see what you do in there? So there's obviously to me there's like there's obviously some stuff going on with urine therapy. I want to get a little bit into how it's being made into um, how it's being made into into pharmaceuticals. What did I want to show you on this? Uh, cow urine has been granted um, US patents for its medicinal properties as a bioenhancer with antibiotics, antifungal and anti-cancer drugs. This idea of bioenhancer, improving bioavailability, this, to me, this is, this is fascinating. Like what's really going on there? Like, why, is, why, are nutrients, why are nutrients able to upcycle? If we look at cow urine versus human urine, uh, basically made up of water, urea, sodium, chloride, sulfate, phosphate, potassium, creatine, 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 ammonia, uric acid, and a fat cow urine isn't much different from human urine. So it's hard to believe drinking one is good for health and drinking the other is, is disgusting. And I would say drinking or popping it in, in, in a pill form. This is interesting. This is from Pharmaceutical Business Review, and this is on the use of, of urea. Urea compounds are increasingly used in medicinal chemistry and drug design in order to establish key drug target interactions and fine tune crucial drug-like properties. This, this top part is fascinating too. Uh, okay, so it's a, it's a powder. It's now being created synthetically, but urea, remember that's 2% of what's in urine. So 95% of urine's water, 5% is other stuff. Two, two of that 5% is urea. So it's like the big ingredient in urine. This is what's wild. And this is why I think it destroys AMA and kills bad and good bacteria, but sustains and uh, nourishes the good bacteria. And if you go back to microbiome and good bacteria, that's important. So urea is commonly used in denaturing and solubilizing proteins. As a chaotropic agent, it's used to restructure proteins. In certain cases where proteins are denatured, urea may be used in renaturing these proteins. So it can build them up or it can break it down. It can build up the stuff that creates bacteria, the energy blocks or protein or amino acids or polypeptides that build, right? That build good bacteria and it can break down bad bacteria. And that seems to be a function in the urea. Pharmaceutical agency or uh, businesses are onto it and that's why they're starting to use more and more urea. Okay, I wanted a picture of uh, hormones more easily absorbed in the colon. This might just be way too graphic for some of you, but in Ayurveda, like the colon is used to pacify conditions of vata. 
All right. So now this, I think this is maybe part of what comes into question of like, why haven't you heard more about this? Um, A, like it's hard for certain, when I'm like talking to different doctors about it, what I found is they haven't been too public about it because they don't want to be seen as quacks. They don't want to be associated with something that uh, provokes so much disgust and can discredit the other stuff that they do. Right. Uh, But when you also see like what industries are at stake, like we see that uh, we see urea appearing in the most expensive skin creams and skincare products. Uh, the ammonia in, in urine is a teeth whitening agent. I can tell you my mouth has never been healthier, even though I'm only a couple months into this. Uh, it's probiotic. So you're going to have like, you know, probiotic and electrolyte drinks sort of start to go out the window. There's so many vitamins in your urine that, that your need for more vitamins, if you, have, um, if you have a good diet, that also includes wild invasives. Like you wouldn't need that either. First aid, uh, bites, wounds. Also, uh, say you get sunburn, you put it on your skin, your sunburn goes away. Um, it's like a tanning agent in a way. Like the more you use it for longer, your skin becomes more naturally uh, balanced with melatonin. So it beca- becomes an agent to protect your skin. It goes on and on. Uh, shampoo or conditioner, like rinsing your hair with fresh urine and then water seems to do the job. And this is what starts to happen is you become more of a creator than a consumer, the more you deep dive into the gold pool. So here she is saying like, well, these are the things that happened. And this is really just me telling my own story. Like it seems to have a massive effect on digestion. I feel like I need about a third less calories. Uh, And that's just like roughly, but things change. Like your skin changes, your sleep will get deeper. And a lot of that's because of the, the hormones, uh, the, the sex hormones, not the stress hormones that are in your urine that your body wants to upcycle. You'll find that, you know, if you have any mouth issues, teeth, gums, um, that those will start to, that those might start to really change. Uh, you won't c- crave junk. I find this part is really interesting. That it starts to change your palate, like what you want to eat. There's feedback loop right? Because you, if you're tasting your pee, you'll just notice if, if it's too salty or too sweet or too this or too that, or if you've had junk, it'll change the taste of your pee. And it's not intellectual. So many, I mean, I've been coaching, uh, I mean, as an Ayurvedic medicine practitioner, and then as the head coach at Yoga Healer for a couple decades, people are like, what do I eat? And I'm always like, your body is going to tell you what you need to eat. It improves your ability to intuit that because it's so physical, It's really physical. So you don't struggle with mind over matter anymore. This is like matter informing mind at a, at a very primitive, at a very primitive level. All right. So you get super hydrated. And I think that takes also, there's a huge, huge correlation between, um, between mental health and sorry, I keep doing that between mental health and dehydration. Like if someone's anxious, like the first thing you want to check is hydration. Often not talked about. Uh, but like, wow, if someone's deeply hydrated, what happens to mental health? It starts to change because you simply feel like you can sustain yourself. And that's, uh, it's happening on a, on a subtle level. So a couple more minutes and then I'll wrap up. So this is bathing your feet in pee. So your, your feet holes, you have skin pores in your feet. So these little tiny holes in your skin and your feet. Those uh, are able to uptake the larger molecules. Remember when we were looking at what's actually in the blood and the size of some molecules. So molecules that are bigger, like antibodies and hormones, those can get upcycled through skin absorption and the feet have the biggest pores in the body. So soaking your feet in pee might seem totally weird and bizarre, but you know, try it. It can be pretty low, low barrier to entry, especially for people who have like really strong disgust factor with pee uh, and aversion. Refreshing the mind, I find really fascinating. So people that are struggling with anxiety or mental health, I know mental health has been a really hot topic with COVID and a lot of the isolation that's happened and just a lot of the restraint of freedoms that's happened. Like this is a way that you can replenish, you can start to replenish your physiology for free. All right, let's go to my enema guy. So how do you do enemas? The $1 or $2 uh it's usually like a plastic saline enema kit at the drugstore. They also sell them at grocery stores in the, in the, uh, in the drugstore section. 
you just dump out the salt water and then you, and then you put your pee in it. And that's how you do an enema. So anyone struggling with, uh, oh my gosh, I mean, anything from joint issues and arthritis to uh, digestion absorption issues to constipation uh, to mental health, to hormonal issues, uh, the enema is going to be a really easy, it really, it's much, e if, if you've never done an enema, the barrier to entry that I get it, it can be really, really unnecessarily high just because of lack of familiarity. Uh, but once you start doing it, it's like something that honestly will take you less than 60 seconds. It's just not a big deal doing it before bed and absorbing what's in your urine overnight. That can be good. You can do it with aged urine. If you start to, if you start to stockpile your urine, um, and then it becomes more and more medicinal, more and more potent. I don't have an image on urine sniffing. That's something I've recently become just a gigantic fan of. The more I study pineal gland, uh, I, if anyone knows of any research on pineal gland endogenous um, DMT and urine therapy, I'm looking for research on that. There seems to be, uh, and I think it's the ammonia in the urine, it starts to open the sinuses and the deeper sinuses, which make your brain a lot more awake and focused and clears your nasal passages of, of any sort of, doesn't necessarily, mucus might not be blocking. Like for some people, you may have mucus and yeah, you'll clear your mucus, you'll clear your mucus, yes. Now, after that, after your mucus is cleared and you're not dealing with ama or undigested stuff in your sinus passages, after that's cleared and gone, there's a penetration that starts to create a, a higher level of awakening. So really good to do before you meditate or do breathing practices. Just snort a little urine uh, or even sniffing urine. Anyone who has lung sinus issues, asthma issues, uh, sinus headaches, like any of that stuff. Anyone who gets swollen glands in your neck and throat swishing with your urine, and that's actually also, I'm finding a pretty easy way for people to start is like mid afternoon urine, which tends to be more watery, taking a mouthful and just swishing it. You don't have to swallow it. You can spit it out, but just swishing it through. And if it's too strong, dilute it, half water, half urine, just start to swish it. And you'll start to notice it'll pull just like oil pulling, but maybe even more effective because the ammonia, it'll start to pull stuff that doesn't want to be in your head cavity out and it'll start to clear your lymphatics. All right, and I just wanna end on two more slides. One is, wow, we have almost 200 people that are still here. Go team, we're interested in urine therapy. Yeah, who knew, Kate, who knew, who knew? All right, so this is what's interesting is like in utero, in the amniotic fluid, it's, it's over 90% urine. So like you've already been bathing in urine. It's why babies come out so like their skin is amazing and they smell so good for that first six months of their life. They're, they've been in a high urea concentration. They've been in urine in the womb. Now, what's interesting, this came from an, my research on Irish grandmother, go Ireland, grandmother tradition, rubbing babies with pee, infant massage with pee. Anyone who studied Ayurveda know we do infant massage with oil. Before then, we were doing it with pee. Think of how hard it was for humans to get their hands on oil 2,000 years ago. How, I mean... It, the same thing's true with, with flour, like to, to get flour, like wheat flour was a really hard endeavor. When I was in China, when I was doing the Chinese um, political economy and global warming stuff in my, in my college years, I was hiking with a friend. We did like a backpacking trip on the great wall. Like, and I don't advise this. And this was like way back before China was as pop, whatever, um, it was populated, but it wasn't like touristy popular. We just decided to go on a backpacking trip on the Great Wall, which was amazing. And a part that wasn't like touristed at all. And we, we got kicked off in a demilitarized zone. Like basically a guy with a machine gun was like, you cannot be here. And so we, we had to like hike down the back way into some town and find our way back to Beijing. And uh, as we hiked down the back way, we, we, we were in a very isolated village. And in this village, there's this old guy. I'll never forget this. It's so imprinted in my memory. And he was, he was pulling this huge, heavy, round stone behind him and crushing wheat with a stone. And this was in the 90s. It was, I think I was there in 95. So it's like, you know, 26 years ago. It's not 1,000 years ago. And there, he was making flour out of grain. And you started to see, like, the labor intensiveness. First, you have to grow the wheat. Then you have to, then you, have to you know break apart the, um, 
the the kernel from the shaft and then you've got to grind it into a flour and you start to think of how labor intensive it is well oil is the same way but oil is is even uh more glorified because it's more nutrient dense so the idea of like what were humans using before before these things um and that's where you can start to really tap into the power of urine therapy i love the picture like again like back to the desert one of the things that's awoken in my consciousness since my explorations with this is understanding how humans have survived. Cause like water or something, especially if anyone's like a backpacker or, um, or has been in remote locations, like water is not always the easiest thing to find. How have humans survived without food during droughts, during famines? And you can start to tap into the sort of archeology span of human history and being like, Oh, humans have always known this stuff. We've always known this. this is why it shows up in Native American medicine. This is why it shows up in uh, actually Anna, uh, who's in our enrollment team. She put me in touch with a professor in Australia who works with the First Peoples of Australia and urine therapy. Right? We see it show up in wild, in more wild humans. So it's not that we that we didn't know this, and when we start to see that it's uh, it's so deeply it's so deeply part of who we are. It's so deeply sustaining. What happens, very last slide, and then I'll stop talking, is that you see that there's all these different words that have been used for urine therapy, which we might not be aware of. I added human pipe cleaner. I had to put that one in because that was like the first thing. That was my first experience. It's like, whoa, this clears the channels. This opens the nadis and the shrota. So I added human pipe cleaner. Uh, golden, this whole idea that it's a, a golden fountain, universal medicine, I didn't add on here, but it's noteworthy. Uh, the mother of Ayurveda is another nickname for urine therapy is mother of Ayurveda. And mother is the highest principle nourishment. Highest principle nourishment is what the mother as, a, um, as the archetype stands for. Divine nectar, nectar of heaven, holy liquid, self-transfusion therapy, elixir of life. All right. Oh, I have one more thing to, let's see, I think I can stop screen share. All right, that was long-winded, sorry. I didn't think I'd take like an hour and 20 minutes, but uh, I had a lot to say. So we can do some Q&A if anyone's gotta go, thanks for being here. And uh, if there's stuff in here that you wanna share with friends, we will send the replay. I do want people to be able to share it. I think it's something that you know everyone should know, Every every child should know. I think just this basic stuff about what their pee is, it's really hard to get this information from, you know, just from common culture and from schooling and, and often from even parenting. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Kim, were there questions you wanna like co-host with me? Yeah, let me co-host you. I've been drinking my pee and noticed a film form on top what is what is that? And is that you're aging it or that's just when you're peeing, it's forming on top? Yeah, I mean, this is interesting, this question too of like what, you know, do you wash your genitals prior to collecting? The more, again, this is a fascinating thing. Anyone who wants to understand more about bacteria and the immune system and microbiome, one of the more mainstream books on that um, is An Elegant Defense by, I think his name is Richter. He was a New York Times author, bestseller. And then he wrote a book on the immune system that was really like he knew nothing about it. And he takes that approach from it. Uh, what's interesting is some of the research he pulls in uh, towards the end of that book is basically like the more you're involved with life with like, I mean, everyone knows the five second rule, like when you drop food on the floor. Now, say you have pets and young children. There's a lot of germs floating around. You drop food on the floor, you pick it up, you eat it. Your immune system is stronger and more adaptable. The more sterile an environment you live in, the more you decrease the diversity of your microbiome. So the healthiest animals are wild. Wild animals have 30% more, and mammals are mammals. They have 30% more microbiome than we do because, we've, because our microbiome has been denatured and decultured out of us. And it leaves us highly susceptible. So the more diverse your microbiome is, the less you're worried about things being um, sterile and you have less fear. You start to have a lot less fear about life in general, 
because like life is life and you're actually informing yourself. You're part of the whole. And you know, the, the whole teaching on bacteria is, is super fascinating. Like who you are is so much more than you. Anyone who's ever needed a, um, a fecal implant. I had a, I had a good friend uh, from, from my early childhood and her body was so destroyed by antibiotics over time. And, and, and she had had health issues for years. She went totally allopathic um, pharmaceuticals on all of her health issues, pharmaceuticals and surgeries. It just totally destroyed her microbiome to a point where like she wanted to get out of this world you know, like just so uncomfortable in daily life. Um, and she had a fecal implant. It changed her life. That's where you, you stick someone else's poop up your butt, right? So why? Because it has good bacteria and good bacteria, bacteria um, can breed itself, right? And nourish the deeper tissue of the body. So we start to have a much more symbiotic and harmonic experience of life rather than this, um, this sterile, uh, sterile anti, and it's, it's an anti-life form of life that uh, is to me part of just modern culture and plastic culture and, and this and that. So no, I mean, what I'm finding personally, oh, thanks Anna for all the questions. What I'm finding personally is that you get really involved with your body you get really curious even about like the smells and the tastes and, and the, and what's coming out of your body. And, and that's part of the process of rewilding, like part of rubbing urine on your skin and awakening your skin microbiome and attuning to smell and scent is you, you start to be attracted to that, which it, that, which is nourishing the microbiome and you start to be repulsed from that, which is synthetic and destroying the microbiome. And there's synthetic smells like, you know, if anyone's ever been in a big box store and you walk into the bathroom and you might smell a, a xenotoxin or something that's in a, a synthetic smell that's added to a cleaning ingredient. And you might, you might notice that you're un, uncomfortable. You might notice if you're attuned to meditation that you notice your thoughts, you might notice your thoughts turn negative, first retract into fear and then go to negativity. It's very subtle, right? But if you start to notice it, you're like, oh, I got to get out of here right? Like this is a toxic environment. Um, so again, first it's sterile, then it's synthetic. And those are the things you'll have more and more repulsion from. And what you'll have more and more trust in is your, your own intuitive experience. Uh, so you wouldn't need to like, you wouldn't need to like cleanse your genital area before peeing because your genital area would be, it, it would actually be micro, a microbiotic rich area a very microbiotic rich area that you'd be like, no, that's fine. If some of those little microbiomes get into my urine and I'm upcycling that too, then yay, more is more. Okay. Uh, yeah, collecting pee during menses. Yeah, okay, what's nuts about that, what's nuts about that um, is there's a lot in menses. So menses is really high in antibiotic, uh, or sorry, antibodies. And so there's a, there's a degree of, and this is going to totally gross a lot of people out. So if I haven't grossed you out yet, let's see if I can raise the bar. Uh, there's so much nourishment in menstrual fluid. Like many of you who have used like a diva cup, collected your blood and then added it to water and then watered your plants with it. You might be being like, why does that work? Why do plants like menstrual blood? Why is it a fertilizer? Right? Why was it used on the altars in paganism? Like, what's in menstrual? What's really in menstrual blood? Well, we know, uh, again, in the in the Vedic years, post Brahmin Vedic years. So this Dhammar Tantra is pre, it's sort of pre all the casting society and 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 before all that purity came in, right? Just like paganism is before like purity came into the Judeo Christian mindset. What seems to happen is like you worship that which works. And, and that which is in menstrual blood is, is, is a very, very highly valued, um, if you will, cellular matrix. So what you'll find if, if you upcycle your urine when you're menstruating is that that stuff is way more powerful and you'll upcycle your essence more and more. And that will tune you more into the vibration of you. So this idea of that, that what urine actually has in it is a holotrophic spiritual vibration of, of you, like you become more you. And obviously you become more of like good bacteria too, 
but all of that is, is in the vibration of, of your, your unique snowflake self. That's where it goes into the psycho-spiritual nature of it. So the menstrual fluid, what you'll notice with this in, um, in Ayurveda, when you're menstruating, you're on a very vata pacifying, easy to digest diet because digestion decreases, like your body's ability to make the outside the inside and go through that process of assimilating food, that decreases. And so if you do that, if you overeat when you're menstruating, you might notice that like your next month isn't as good. Then if you're like finely attuned to eating that, which is nourishing and really easy to, to digest, which is usually one pot meals or soups or foods that are just easy to digest, or you eat lighter, you'll have a much stronger next month. What I notice from urine and menses is that like, if you upcycle that, it's really intense. It's a really intense experience, but it rewilds you much faster. Okay. Uh, if all this stuff in pee is good, then why does the body get rid of it so frequently? Yeah. Uh, so like, I think if you go back to the, the slides on like composting, it's part of the cycle. It's part of a cycle of moving things through the system that, that, that life is cyclical. And so there has to be output to have input. It's one of the ways that I think about it. The other thing that happens is that the more you use it, Perry, the more you'll notice that your, your urine will become more refined and more nourishing. So it even starts to take on like the taste more of like coconut water. Waste is part of the, in Ayurveda, waste is part of the functional part of the whole tissue creation. So it's not, waste isn't outside of that. Like the word mala, it's different. It's a different, we translate it as waste, but it's, it doesn't directly translate because waste in, the, in, in English refers to something that's, it's interesting. It refers to something that's toxic or not part of the functional system. In Ayurveda, we have a really different word for that. So mala is the word we use for, for, for the byproducts of the body, menstrual fluid, sweat, urine, feces. Ama is the word we use for toxin. And it's that which is not functional within the body. It's that which the body cannot digest. It's not the same word. And this happens all over the place with Eastern versus Western thought. We don't have the words for it in the West. We have words for it in the East. The same thing happens with consciousness. Anyone who's ever studied yoga and enlightenment, you'll know that like we have a lot more words for consciousness if we use a different language like Sanskrit or, or Chinese or Tibetan language. And we have a lot of different words because there's a lot more, there's a lot much more of a deeper understanding of the holistic system. So once you see it from the holistic system part, you're like, yeah, stuff has to move out so it can come back in. So you can get the feedback loop part of that. It also goes into, you know, part of the smell thing, there's pheromones in urine. I was looking into this, it's super fascinating. I know I could talk for hours on this and you all have to go, but pheromones, uh, pheromones are the hormones that attract via smell and it's very instinctual. And I find this really fascinating uh, because it's connected to, with, to mammalian uh, mating. So who, who you're gonna sleep with, who you're gonna have offspring with, you're attracted at the pheromonal level to that. Now, if someone has like good healthy urine, you're attracted to that. If they have a lot of inflammation in their body, their urine's gonna be different and it'll come up at that level and you'll have repulsion from that. And that works for all mammals, including all mammals that you sent, including, you guessed it, smart monkeys. All right. Awesome, you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for your attention. And uh, enjoy your experiments. It's really all about that. Follow your intuition. See where it goes. And uh, report back to us.